Welcome to Probability Mass Functions. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Now that we have a theoretical framework in place for describing what random variables and probability distributions are, we'll now move on to the practical side of using them to model scenarios that involve data collection or measurement. In particular, we'll explore four commonly used probability mass functions that model the behavior of random variables that represent different applications of counting. These are the binomial distribution, hypergeometric distribution, geometric distribution, and Poisson's distribution. This video lesson will include several examples specifically designed to demonstrate how to compute probabilities using these four distributions. As you get into those examples, you'll see that I'm computing the probabilities directly from the theoretical formulas that define the probability distributions. However, there's also a technological companion to this video lesson, and you can find a link to it both at the end of this video and in the description for this video. That technological companion will revisit the examples from this video lesson and demonstrate to you how to compute the same probabilities using both MATLAB and a TI-84 Plus calculator. We'll begin by introducing one of the simplest probability distributions that there is, the Bernoulli trial. And while we won't use the Bernoulli trial to compute probabilities directly, we'll find that it forms the foundation of two of the discrete probability distributions, two of the probability mass functions that we'll commonly work with, and several others that are out there in the world that we won't introduce as a part of this video lesson. So a Bernoulli trial is any random process that may result in one of two outcomes. Typically, we would assign a probability of p to the first outcome and one minus p to the second. Bernoulli trials form the basis for several probability distributions that were introduced by Jakob Bernoulli. Now we'll introduce the first widely used probability mass function that we'll see many applications for, and it's one of the two that we will introduce that is based upon Bernoulli trials. And that's the binomial distribution. So if we consider an experiment in which n Bernoulli trials occur, and the probability of observing a preferred outcome in any one trial is p, then the probability of observing x preferred outcomes among all n trials is given by the binomial distribution, which has the formula of n choose x times p to the power of x times the quantity 1 minus p raised to the power of n minus x. This distribution induces a probability measure on the sample space omega equaling the values 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up through n, with a sigma algebra of s equal to the power set of omega. It's possible for us to prove that the binomial distribution truly satisfies the conditions necessary for it to be considered a probability mass function. And remember that those conditions are that it must take on non-negative values whenever it, we evaluate it at any possible value of x belonging to the sample space. And then if we apply the binomial distribution to all possible values of x in the sample space and sum the results, the sum should come out to be 1. So now we'll go about demonstrating that those two conditions are in fact true for the binomial distribution. Since the trials in our scenario are all independent, the probability of observing any one preferred outcome is p, and the probability of observing any one ordinary outcome is 1 minus p. We can then conclude that the probability of observing one specific sequence of x preferred outcomes and n minus x ordinary outcomes is just p to the power of x times 1 minus p to the power of n minus x. However, if we wish to know the probability of observing any sequence of n outcomes that include this many preferred and ordinary outcomes among them, we need to count the number of ways that we can select x outcomes from the n trials to be preferred. The binomial coefficient n choose x tells us how to do that. 
Since we know the preferred outcomes must be mutually exclusive, we can compute the probability of observing any of them by summing the probabilities of observing each one of them. This results in the stated formula for the binomial distribution. b of n, p, and x equals n choose x times p to the power of x times 1 minus p to the power of n minus x. Now to see that b of n, p, and x induces a probability measure on omega, we need to verify that it satisfies both attributes of a probability mass function, as I've already mentioned. So to see that b of n, p, and x is greater than or equal to zero for each x in our sample space, we need only to look at its formula. The binomial coefficients n choose x are non-negative integers regardless of the value of x. Since p is a value between 0 and 1, 1 minus p is also a value between 0 and 1. Furthermore, since x and n minus x are both non-negative integers, both p raised to the power of x and 1 minus p raised to the power of n minus x must be positive. Finally, since b of n, p, and x is just the product of these three non-negative quantities, b of n, p, and x must be non-negative for each value of x belonging to our sample space. In other words, each value of x such that x is greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to n. In order to see that the sum of all possible values of the binomial distribution equals one, we really just need to appeal to a fundamental theorem from algebra known as the binomial theorem. So if we plug all possible values of x into the binomial distribution, x ranging from 0 through n, and then sum them up. And we get the formula sum of x equals 0 through n of n choose x times p to the x times 1 minus p to the n minus x. And that simplifies to p times the quantity of 1 minus p all raised to the nth power. But p plus 1 minus p simplifies to 1. So our whole sum simplifies to 1 raised to the nth power, which is just 1. Therefore, the binomial distribution induces a probability measure on omega. The binomial distribution is the first of several probability distributions we'll work with that depends not just on the value of the random variable that you supply to it, but also upon one or more input parameters. In the case of the binomial distribution, it depends upon the input parameters n and p, which once again represent the number of independent Bernoulli trials that are a part of the process, and then the probability that any given Bernoulli trial will result in a preferred outcome. So if you fix those parameters to different values, it's going to cause the binomial distribution to take on different shapes. Several bar graphs of the binomial distribution are shown below for n equals 30 and several different choices of p. So the binomial distribution with a relatively low value of p, or 15%, is the narrow and tall histogram represented in blue. A more moderate value of p equals 0 0.5 results in a shorter and broader distribution that we can see with a histogram that's colored red. And then finally, as we increase p to a value closer to 1, p equals 0 0.75, the histogram begins to steepen and become narrow again, but it moves even further to the right compared to the other two histograms. This is represented by the yellow histogram in our figure. The previous figure illustrated how changing the values of the parameters n and p of the binomial distribution can impact the shape of the binomial distribution. Another way to comprehend the relationship between the input parameters of a probability distribution and its shape is to attempt to derive formulas for the theoretical shape parameters of that probability distribution in terms of the input parameters. In other words, we could look for formulas for the mean, the variance, the skewness, and kurtosis of a distribution in terms of its input parameters. It's actually possible for most of the distributions that we're going to look at to come up with closed form derivations of those formulas, and in fact, many of them are included in the in appendix of our text. However, here I'm just going to state those formulas because for our purposes, it's mostly 
sufficient to be able to look the formulas up for the applications that we're going to have for them. Anyway, the mean, the theoretical mean of the binomial distribution is just equal to n times p. The theoretical variance is equal to n times p times 1 minus p. The theoretical standard deviation is just equal to the square root of the theoretical variance. The theoretical skewness is quantity 1 minus 2p divided by the square root of np times 1 minus p. And the kurtosis is a little bit more messy. It's the quantity of 1 minus 6p times 1 minus p, all divided by n times p times 1 minus p, and then all of that plus 3. Having these formulas are useful when we're trying to evaluate how well a binomial distribution models a data set, and we'll explore that in the next example. That's going to be our primary purpose for knowing the formulas of our theoretical shape parameters for any of our distributions at this point. So imagine we have a data set, D, consisting of the numbers 12, 7, 7, 7, 9, 8, 6, 6, 9, 8, 10, 9, 6, 10, 9, 11, 6, 9, 7, and 10. Now we have reason to believe that this data was collected by a process that could be modeled by a binomial distribution with n equals 25 Bernoulli trials and a probability of p equals 0.33 for observing a preferred outcome on any one of those Bernoulli trials. One source of this belief is how well the histogram of this data matches the theoretical frequencies predicted by the binomial distribution. And we'll look at that in the next figure. Here, the blue bar graph represents the empirical frequencies of each value of x that appears in our particular data set, and the orange bar graph is the theoretical frequencies predicted by the binomial distribution. The way we would get the heights for that theoretical frequency bar graph would be to take the probability value predicted by the binomial distribution at each value of x and then multiply that by the number of observations present in our data set, and there are 20 of those. So if you perform a casual comparison of the empirical blue histogram and the theoretical orange histogram, you should conclude that they fit each other reasonably well. They're not bad. They're both about the same height and width. They're a reasonable fit, especially for a data set that only contains 20 data points. We can also compare the data to the theoretical model with a more quantitative tool. If we recall our work with descriptive statistics, we could compute the empirical mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis of our data set from their respective formulas. We can also correct the theoretical mean, variance, skewness, and kurtosis of the binomial distribution by plugging n equals 25 and p equals 0.33 into the respective theoretical shape parameter formulas we saw just a few slides ago. These results are summarized on the table that you're viewing now. And you can see the means are pretty close. The variances are at least in the same ballpark. They're both close to four. Uh, the skewnesses are reasonably close, and the kurtosises are, are also reasonably close. For such a small data set, these compare reasonably well. It suggests a good fit of the binomial model to the data that we've collected. So we've looked at a somewhat subjective comparison uh, between the theoretical model and the empirical data. That was our two histograms, and a more objective comparison looking at the closeness between the theoretical and empirical shape parameters on a numerical basis. So now, finally, we'll explore how to compute probabilities with the binomial distribution for several events through several different examples. So in our first example, we'll imagine that an agricultural engineer applies a new pesticide to a group of 40 cabbage plants in hopes of controlling infestation by cabbage worms. She has already determined that the pesticide has an average success rate of 78%. In other words, she expects that any given cabbage plant will remain worm-free 78% of the time when treated by the pesticide. 
For a technical report, she must state the probability that exactly three quarters of the plants in her group will remain worm free and the probabilities that over half or fewer of the plants in her group will remain worm free. So those are two different events that she must compute the probability for. In order to compute these probabilities, it's not a bad idea to begin by considering the given information and then interpreting it in terms of the binomial distribution. And in this case, her 40 plants represent the number of Bernoulli trials. Each plant represents a Bernoulli trial. It either will or will not remain worm-free after treatment by the pesticide. The success rate of 78% for the pesticide represents the probability of obtaining a preferred outcome in the Bernoulli trial. In other words, the event that a cabbage plant remains worm-free is the preferred outcome and it has a probability of 0.78. Now, the first event that the agricultural engineer had to consider was that exactly three quarters of her sample of, of plants remains worm-free. There were 40 plants in the sample. Three quarters represents a value of x equals 30 for the random variable. So we are looking to calculate the probability that x equals 30 under our modeled binomial distribution. We can compute that by plugging n equals 40, p equals 0.78, and x equals 30 into our binomial distribution formula in order to obtain 40 choose 30 times 0.78 to the 30th power times 0.22 times the 10th power. That results in a probability of 0.1304, or just slightly over 13%. The second event that the agricultural engineer had to consider was that half or fewer of the plants in her sample would remain worm-free. This is x is less than or equal to 20. This event represents a range of x values rather than just a single x value. It's all values of x starting at 0 and going all the way up to 20. For that reason, we have to plug each of those values of x into our binomial distribution individually and sum them up. If you were to perform that computation, you should find that the probability is quite small. It comes out to be 9.1352 times 10 to the negative 5. So it's a very unlikely event that half or fewer of the plants would remain worm-free. We'd expect more than that. Let's consider another example. In this example, a fisheries biologist is studying a population of fish that includes a subpopulation of rainbow trout. He plans to sample that population with replacement 10 times by practicing catch and release fishing. And he knows that the probability of catching a rainbow trout on any given attempt is just 0.43. He uses the binomial distribution parameterized with a value of n equals 10 trials and p equals 0.43 to make several predictions. The event of catching 10 fish, of which 7 are rainbow trout, can be represented by setting the random variable x to a value of 7. And if we plug that value of 7 into our parameterized binomial distribution, we get a probability of 10 choose 7 times 0.43 raised to the 7th power times 0.57 raised to the 3rd power. This results in a probability of 0 0.0604, or just over 6%. Likewise, the probability of catching 10 fish, of which at most 7 are rainbow trout, involves an event where the random variable x can't exceed the value of 7. So it takes on all values starting at 0 and going up to 7. If we substitute those values into the binomial distribution formula and sum them up, we compute the desired probability. And that probability is 0.9798, or just under 98%, so it's quite a bit higher. There are other variations we can continue with. The probability of catching 10 fish, of which more than three are rainbow trout, involves the event in which x has to be at least four or more. So x takes on the values four through 10. If we substitute those values into our binomial distribution formula and then sum up the results, we should obtain a probability of 0.6898, or just under 69%. If, on the other hand, 
we're interested in catching 10 fish, of which more than three and at most seven are rainbow trout, then that represents an event for which the random variable must take on the values of four, five, six, or seven. And if we substitute those values into our binomial distribution formula and sum up the results, we should get a probability of 0.6697, or just under 67%. Our next probability mass function is the hypergeometric distribution. And there are some similarities between the hypergeometric distribution and the binomial distribution, especially when you consider how the binomial distribution can be used to model sampling a population of n things with replacement and determining the probability that some number of things within that sample are going to belong to a preferred category. The difference is, is that the hypergeometric distribution models that process when the sampling is done without replacement. Specifically, let's suppose a population consists of capital N members and is partitioned into two distinct subpopulations. The first subpopulation consisting of capital K members is considered to be preferred. If we sample lowercase n members from the overall population without replacement, then h of n, k, lowercase n, and x is equal to k choose x times n minus k choose n minus x divided by capital N choose lowercase n predicts the probability that the sample will include x members of the preferred subpopulation. This distribution induces a probability measure on the sample space omega equals 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up through n, with a sigma algebra of s equals the power set of omega. H is commonly known as the hypergeometric distribution. We can prove that the hypergeometric distribution models what we say it models, as well as the fact that it satisfies the conditions that need to be in place for it to be considered a probability mass function. The formula for the hypergeometric distribution may be obtained by appealing to the techniques of classical probability. We must determine the number of ways that we can collect any sample of n members from the overall population of capital N, and then determine the number of ways that we can collect a specific sample that includes x members belonging to the preferred population and lowercase n minus x members belonging to the other population. The ratio of these two quantities will be our probability because they are the preferred outcome, number of preferred outcomes relative to the total number of possible outcomes. The number of ways we can collect a sample of lowercase n members from the total population is directly computed by the binomial coefficient capital N choose lowercase n. Similarly, the number of ways we can select x members from the preferred subcategory is capital K choose x, and the number of ways that we can select lowercase n minus x members from the other subcategory is capital N minus k choose lowercase n minus x. The multiplication rule tells us that the number of ways to select x members from the preferred subcategory and then n minus x members from the other subcategory is simply k choose x times n minus k choose n minus x. Classical probability then tells us the probability of making such a selection is just k choose x times n minus k choose n minus x divided by the total number of possibilities or capital N choose lowercase n. So that's where the hypergeometric probability distribution formula comes from. To see that h of n, k, lowercase n, and x actually induces a probability measure on omega and s, we just need to verify that both criteria of the definition of a probability mass function are met. Well, h of n and k and lowercase n and x is non-negative for each value of x and omega because binomial coefficients are just non-negative integers and h of n and k and lowercase n and x is computed as the product and quotient of binomial coefficients. There's no other option but for h to take on non-negative values for any of the allowed inputs of x from the sample space. 
In order to demonstrate that the sum of all of the possible probabilities that H takes on at each of the possible values of X in the sample space results in a value of 1, it would suffice to show that the sum of the numerators in the hypergeometric formula comes out to be equal to the denominator in the hypergeometric formula. In other words, sums to capital N, choose lowercase n. Well, to see this, on one hand, we can interpret capital N, choose lowercase n as the number of ways we can select n objects from a larger group of capital N objects. However, if the larger group of n objects is partitioned into two disjoint categories, the first with k members and the second with n minus k members, then we can imagine this process of forming a group with n things taken from capital N things in another way. We can account for the number of ways to form our group so that it consists of only no members taken from the first category and all members taken from the second. There are k choose 0 times n minus k choose lowercase n ways to form such a group. Then we can also account for the number of ways to form the group so that it consists of one member from the first category and the remaining members coming from the second. There are k choose 1 times n minus k choose lowercase n minus 1 ways to form such a group. Continuing, we can account for the number of ways to form the group so that it consists of two members from the first category and the remaining members from the second. There are k choose 2 times n minus k choose n minus 2 ways to form the group. We can account for the number of ways to form the group so that it consists of three members coming from the first category and the remaining members coming from the second. There are k choose 3 times n minus k choose lowercase n minus 3 ways to form that group. And this process continues. We continue until we have accounted for the number of ways to form the group so it consists only of members from the first category and no members from the second. There are k choose lowercase n times n minus k choose zero ways to form that group. After listing these possibilities, we just recognize that they are all of the possible ways of choosing a set of lowercase n things from our larger group of n things. We've just partitioned them into the different ways we can assign which of those lowercase n things come from the preferred category of k things and which of the n things come from the other category. So after listing these po possibilities, we sum them in order to obtain an alternate way of computing the number of ways to form a group of lowercase n objects taken from the larger group of capital N. This is just the formula we've already seen, the sum uh, over x starting at 0 and ending at lowercase n of k choose x times n minus k choose n minus x. Therefore, we can conclude that that sum is just another way of writing capital N choose lowercase n. This implies that the sum of the hypergeometric distribution over all of its values comes out to be 1. Therefore, the hypergeometric distribution does in fact induce a probability measure on omega and s because it represents a valid probability mass function on omega and s. As we did with the binomial distribution, we can inspect the different shapes of the hypergeometric distribution corresponding to different sets of parameter values. Several bar graphs of the hypergeometric distribution are shown below for n equals 450, our total population size, lowercase n equals 30, our sample size, and several choices of k, the preferred population size. So the distribution shifted to the farthest to the left corresponds to a relatively small preferred population size of 40, and that's the blue histogram in our figure. The central red histogram in the figure corresponds to a moderate preferred population size compared to the total population size of k equals 225, and that's the central red histogram. And then finally, for a fairly large preferred population size in comparison to the total population size, k equal 400, 
we see the histogram furthest to the right that's taller and skinnier and colored yellow. One way we can generalize what's going on here is if k, the preferred population size, is either close to zero or close to the total population size, then we're going to expect to see a tall and skinny distribution clustered down towards zero or up towards the total population size of n, respectively. More intermediate values of k, those that are neither close to zero nor the total population size, are going to result in distributions with histograms that are less steep and more broad, like the red histogram we see in the middle of our figure. We can also investigate the impact of the input parameters of the hypergeometric distribution upon its shape by deriving formulas for the theoretical shape parameters of the hypergeometric distribution. In other words, deriving formulas for the mean, the variance, the skewness, and the kurtosis that depend on the input parameters, the lowercase n, sample size, capital N, total population size, and capital K, preferred population size. And as you can see, those shape parameter formulas, the theoretical shape parameter formulas, get complicated quickly. The formula for the mean and the variance aren't too bad, and many people can even memorize them with enough repeated use, but the others, we're really often going to just need to look them up when we need them, so I'm not even going to try to state them out loud. They are what they are. So as we saw with the binomial distribution, these can be used to assess the fit between the hypergeometric distribution and a data set that we believe to be modeled by it. While we won't look at a specific example of how that might work in this video lesson, it's certainly a process that you could undertake and you'd find that it's very similar to what we did with the binomial distribution. Suppose the leadership at a small corporation has decided to form a working committee by randomly selecting 10 of 145 employees. Now, since 51 of the employees have worked at the corporation for at least 12 years and the rest have not, there is some concern that the committee might wind up with too many junior employees. Corporate leadership has decided that it would be a mistake if 80% or more of the committee is made up of junior employees. By interpreting the process of forming the committee as a form of sampling without replacement and modeling it with the hypergeometric distribution, we can determine how likely it is that the committee has too many junior employees. Let n equal 145 represent the total number of employees in the company, and k equal 94 represent the number of junior employees in the company, our preferred subpopulation. Then let lowercase n equals 10 represent the size of the committee, this would be our sample size, and let x represent the number of junior employees selected to be in the committee. The probability that the committee will be made up of 80% or more junior employees is the probability that x is greater than or equal to 8. This means that we're asking what's the probability that x takes on the values 8, 9, or 10. And we can compute that probability by plugging those values into our hypergeometric distribution formula parameterized with the values of n equal 145, k equal 94, and lowercase n equals 10, and then summing up the resulting probabilities. If you do this computation on your own, you should find that the probability comes out to be about 0 0.2490. Thus, we see that it is more likely that the committee will have enough senior employees, but it is by no means outside the realm of possibility that more than 80% of the committee would be junior employees. It could happen almost 25% of the time if we were selecting our committee purely at random. If this is a serious enough of a concern, corporate leadership might want to think of another plan for forming the committee besides random lottery. Our next probability mass function is the geometric distribution, and we'll define it from within the following theorem. Suppose you conduct an indefinite sequence of Bernoulli trials, where the probability of observing a preferred outcome on any given trial is p. The geometric distribution, or g of p in x, equals p, times 1 minus p raised to the power of x minus 1 
predicts the probability that the first preferred outcome will occur on trial number x. g of p into x induces a probability measure on the sample space omega, which equals the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And a sigma algebra of s equals the power set generated by omega. You should note that there is an alternate form of the geometric distribution, which I will denote as g sub zero of p and x, and it equals p times the quantity of one minus p raised to the power of x, as opposed to the power of x minus one. This predicts something a little bit different. g sub zero of p and x predicts the probability that you must complete x trials before observing the first preferred outcome. G sub zero of P and X also induces a probability measure on our sample space, but this time the sample space includes the numbers zero, one, two, three, and four, and so on. And then the sigma algebra is still S equal to the power set generated by omega. In a sense, the two versions of the geometric distribution can be used interchangeably to model the same scenario. But you've got to be careful with how you choose to represent your data with a random variable. If your random variable is a count of the number of trials it takes you to get to the first preferred outcome, then you should probably use g of p and x for your model. If, on the other hand, your random variable models the number of ordinary outcomes that you have to experience before achieving the first preferred outcome, then you probably want to use g sub zero of p and x. This isn't an enormous concern. One thing that you can always consider doing is converting your data from one form to the other, either by adding one to all values in the data set or subtracting one from all values in the data set. But this is something that requires some thought, and it's thought that you must put into it before just haphazardly choosing one form of the geometric distribution over the other in order to model a scenario. If you just choose arbitrarily and you choose wrong, it will predict incorrect probabilities. Well, now we'll prove the geometric distribution theorem. The geometric distribution models a sequence of independent Bernoulli trials resulting in a sequence of x minus 1 ordinary outcomes with a probability of 1 minus p, followed by one preferred outcome with a probability of p. Since each outcome is independent of the others, the probability of observing all of these outcomes in the entire sequence is simply the product of their individual probabilities, or g of p and x equals 1 minus p times 1 minus p times 1 minus p, a total of x minus 1 times, finally times p. And this simplifies to 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1 times p. And that's the formula for the first form of the geometric distribution. I'm not going to do it here, but the second form for g sub 0 of p and x can be derived using very similar reasoning. To see that g of p and x induces a probability measure on omega equals 1, 2, 3, and so on, with a sigma algebra of the power set of omega, we need only to verify properties 1 and 2 from the definition of a probability mass function. In other words, we need to begin by showing that g of p and x is non-negative for any value of x in the sample space that we might plug into it. Well, we can do that because both p and 1 minus p are real numbers that fall between 0 and 1, because they're probabilities. Well, when we exponentiate 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1, it's going to remain non-negative. Therefore, 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1 times p is just a product of two non-negative numbers, so itself must be non-negative. That demonstrates that g of p and x satisfies the first property of a probability mass function see that the sum of all of the geometric probabilities over all of the possible values within the sample space equals 1, we've got to appeal to something called a geometric series. And if you're not familiar with what a geometric series is or how it works, 
there is some supplemental material in the appendix of our text that, that um, summarizes them. But I'm just going to rely on those properties for this proof here. So if we plug in all values of x starting at 1 and going up towards infinity into g of p of x and then sum up the resulting probabilities, that just is equivalent to plugging x equals 1, 2, 3, and so on into 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1 times p and summing up the results. Notice that we can factor the coefficient p out of that sum, and I do that on the second line of this, this mathematical argument. And so then I have p times 1 minus p, which is a p times the sum over 1 minus p, which is a quantity between 0 and 1, raised to the power of x minus 1. I can re-index that sum by causing x to start at 0 rather than 1, and in order to make that correct, all I've got to do is compensate by kicking the power on 1 minus p up from x minus 1 to x. The reason for doing that is that the sum that now appears in our expression, specifically the sum over x ranging from 0 to infinity of the quantity 1 minus p raised to the power of x, is a geometric series. And it turns out that geometric series can be represented in a closed form. Their sum can be written down in terms of a simple formula without an infinite number of terms. And that formula for that particular geometric series has the sum of 1 over the quantity 1 minus the quantity 1 minus p. And since that whole thing was, has got a coefficient of p on it, we carry that coefficient on to the sum of the geometric series. Well, then it's just a matter of seeing that there's some simplification we can do. That denominator of 1 minus the quantity 1 minus p simplifies to p. And what we're looking at is that the sum of our expression simplifies to p times 1 over p. And that, in turn, simplifies to 1, which is what we were hoping our, our uh, probabilities would sum to. So we've, we've demonstrated that the geometric distribution satisfies the second property of a probability mass function. We could follow a very similar argument to show that the same is true for g sub 0 of p and x as well. So both forms of the geometric distribution satisfy the second property of the probability mass function. Well, what that means for us is that the geometric distribution in either form is a valid probability mass function. As a result, we can conclude that the geometric distribution induces a probability measure on its measurable space, omega and s. We might ask what sort of distribution the geometric distribution is. How does it behave? The following figure displays several bar graphs or several histograms of the geometric distribution corresponding to various choices of the input parameter p. If p is fairly small, such as 0.005, the distribution is going to have a very shallow peak on the left, and it's going to decay to the right at a very slow rate. And this is depicted by the blue histogram that you almost can't see because the bar heights are so small in our picture. For more moderate values of the geometric distribution, we can see that the peak of the distribution starts to grow on the left, but not much. This is illustrated by the red histogram, which corresponds to a value of p equals 0.05 or 5% likelihood of observing the preferred outcome on any one trial. And then finally, as, as p begins to grow to larger, you know, more significant values, such as p equals 0.5 or 50 percent, we can see that there's a very noticeable peak at the far left of the histogram and then rapid decay from that peak down towards zero as you take on x values that move out farther to the right. Shape parameters of the geometric distribution are given in terms of the probability p, our input parameter, of observing the preferred outcome on any given trial.
the first form of the geometric distribution, or g of p and x, has a theoretical mean of 1 over p, a theoretical variance of 1, 1 minus p over p squared, a theoretical skewness of 2 minus p over the root of 1 minus p, and a theoretical kurtosis of 9 plus p squared over 1 minus p. On the other hand, the second form of the geometric distribution, or g sub 0 of p and x, has a theoretical mean of 1 minus p over p. And then all of the remaining theoretical shape parameters are the same as those that we found for g of p and x, the first form of the geometric distribution. We might gain some experience and insight into computing probabilities with the geometric distribution by studying an example. In this example, a pharmaceutical company offers an antibiotic that they claim to be 82% effective at treating staphylococcus infections. A group of patients suffering from this infection are treated with the antibiotic one at a time. Assuming each patient's response to the antibiotic is independent of the others, we may model the occurrence of the first failure of the antibiotic to treat a case of the infection. In this scenario, we are considering the failure of the drug to treat as a preferred outcome. Since the probability that the antibiotic will not treat the infection for any given patient is 18%, we may say the probability that the first patient, or x equals 1, will not respond to the drug is g of 0.18 and 1, which comes out to be 0 0.82 to the power of 0 times 0 0.18, which is just equal to 0 0.18. On the other hand, the probability that the second patient, or x equals 2, will not respond to the drug is g of 0 0.18 and 2, which comes out to be 0 0.82 to the power of 1 times 0 0.18. This results in a probability of 0 0.1476. The probability that the first failure of the drug will occur by the fifth patient, or x is less than or equal to 5, is g of 0 0.18 and x is less than or equal to 5. This is equivalent to putting in the values x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 into our geometric distribution calibrated with an input parameter value of p equals 0 0.18, and then summing all of those values together. If you perform that calculation, you should get a probability of 0 0.6293. And finally, we could ask, what's the probability that the first failure of the drug will not occur until after 10 patients, where x is greater than or equal to 11, are successfully treated? Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. x is greater than or equal to 11 is an infinite range of x values. These are 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. So one approach would be we could plug all of those values into the geometric distribution, calibrated with an input parameter value of 0 0.18, and then sum them all together. Unfortunately, that would mean we would have to sum together an infinite set of probabilities. If we were doing that with a calculator or by hand, that would take forever. Literally, it would be an infinite number of additions and we wouldn't be able to complete them. So to do this properly, we've got to be a little bit more clever. We could realize that the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11 is equivalent to the probability that x is less than or equal to 10. So we can calculate the probability that x is less than or equal to 10 by plugging in the values of x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10 into the geometric distribution formula calibrated with an input parameter value of p equals 0 0.18, sum all of those together, and then subtract that result from 1, from total probability. If you do that correctly, you should find that you get a probability of 0 0.1374 for that event. Finally, we'll compute one last probability with the geometric distribution in this example, and that's the probability that the first failed treatment will be observed after the sixth patient and before the twelfth. This is equivalent to saying what's the probability that x takes on values including 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11. Well, to compute that probability, we would plug those values into the geometric distribution, 
parameterized with an input parameter value of p equals 0.18 and summing them all together. If you perform that calculation on your own, you should find that you get a probability of 0 0.1913. In this video lesson, we'll introduce one more probability mass function, and that's the Poisson distribution. So consider a process in which a certain outcome occurs at a known average rate or frequency over some given interval. Additionally, assume that the occurrence of the outcome any one time is independent of any other occurrences. We could ask the probability that this event occurs some stated number of times in a fixed interval of time or space. The Poisson distribution addresses this question. I'll present the Poisson distribution formally through a theorem. If an outcome is known to occur at an average rate lambda over some interval, and we assume that each occurrence of the outcome is independent of the others, then the probability of observing x outcomes in the same interval is given by the Poisson distribution, p of lambda and x, which can be written as lambda to the power of x times e to the negative lambda divided by the factorial of x. p of lambda and x induces a probability measure on the sample space omega equaling the values 0, 1, 2, 3, and onward indefinitely, with a sigma algebra of s equal the power set of omega. It's certainly possible to prove the validity of the Poisson distribution theorem. However, that proof is a little bit beyond the scope of this video lesson. You can find it in the appendix of our text. It's just that that proof will rely upon some deeper uh, concepts from calculus, including limits and an understanding of different ways of defining the exponential function that appears in the numerator of the Poisson distribution, e to the negative lambda. So for our purposes, we'll skip that proof and move on to just trying to understand some of the properties of the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution has only one input parameter, and that's lambda, the, the rate. We can investigate the influence the rate parameter has on the shape of the Poisson distribution by, by examining the figure that's, that's displayed for us right now. If lambda is a fairly small number, the Poisson distribution is going to lack symmetry, it's going to have a single peak that's close to zero, and it's going to decay somewhat rapidly as x increases to the right away from zero. However, as we increase the rate parameter lambda to larger and larger values, two things happen, really three things. First, the peak shifts to the right. Second, the histogram for the distribution becomes more and more symmetric around that peak. And third, variability within the distribution increases. We can see that there's more dispersion that's happening or more spread of the probability to the right and the left of the central peak. This behavior is illustrated in the blue, red, and yellow histograms, which are typical of Poisson distributions with small, moderate, and large rate parameters respectively. We can also investigate the influence the rate parameter lambda has on the shape of the Poisson distribution by deriving formulas for the theoretical shape parameters that depend on the rate parameter lambda. And it turns out that those are pretty simple formulas if you do go through the work of deriving them, but I'm just going to present them here. The theoretical mean of the Poisson distribution is equal to the rate parameter lambda. In fact, the variance is as well. The skewness is going to be equal to 1 over the root of lambda, and the kurtosis is going to be equal to 1 over lambda plus 3. We will conclude this video lesson with a brief example that illustrates how to compute probabilities with the Poisson distribution. A fiber optic channel of a communication network has a constant stream of data flowing through it. This data is also constantly checked for transmission errors. On average, a transmission error occurs once every 27 minutes, requiring the data to be resent. If more than 100 transmission errors occur in a day, 
the fiber optic channel will be closed and replaced. A telecommunications engineer is tasked with deciding how likely this is. Since the interval in question is one day, she must find an error rate that is expressed in terms of this time period. She knows that her measured error rate is lambda equals one error every 27 minutes. So this is really important. The stated rate was given as a number of outcomes, number of errors, over a 27-minute interval. Yet the interval that we're actually interested in is one day long. So if we are counting occurrences over one interval and our average rate is expressed relative to another interval, we have to make them compatible before we start working with the Poisson distribution to compute probabilities. And the only reasonable way to make them compatible is to rescale the rate parameter. We can't rescale the data because that will run the risk of taking our discrete data, which takes on integer values, and converting it to real number values. And that wouldn't be something that we could plug into the Poisson distribution formula as it's currently stated and expect to get something reasonable out of it. It's just not designed to handle that. So let's put that information in practice. In terms of days, the rate of lambda equals one error every 27 minutes can be written in terms of errors per day by multiplying one error per 27 minutes by 60 minutes per hour and 24 hours per day. And this will result in an effective error rate of 53.33 errors per day. Now, the communications engineer wanted to know the probability that more than 100 transmission errors could occur in a day. In order to determine this probability, a first step would be to identify the values of x, our random variable, that we are talking about. And more than 100 transmission errors in a day is going to correspond to all of the integer values of x that are greater than 100. So 101, 102, 103, and then so on upward without limit. And we can't simply plug all of those values into our Poisson distribution formula and then sum up the results. There's infinitely many of them. We'd never get it done. But what we can do is say that the probability of getting more than 100 transmission errors is the complement of the probability of getting 100 or fewer transmission errors in a day. So we just compute the probability of getting 100 transmission errors or fewer in a day, and so that's anywhere from 0 through 100. We'll plug those values into the Poisson distribution formula and then sub sum them up and subtract that result from 1. And if you do that computation, you should find that this event has a probability of 4.032 times 10 to the negative 9. This is an extremely small probability, so our communications engineer should conclude that such a large number of transmission errors is highly unlikely. If you saw that, you would probably want to conclude that there was something very, very wrong with the transmission line and you should replace it. And that brings us to the end of our video lesson on a collection of probability mass functions. I hope you found it useful and thank you for watching. Our next video lesson is actually a technological companion to this one. In it, we will revisit all of the examples that we worked through in this video lesson, but we will compute the results not so much directly using the formulas, but with the aid of technology. We'll recreate these examples in a MATLAB live script and see how we can compute probabilities using the binomial hypergeometric geometric and Poisson distributions, and then we'll revisit them one more time and recompute uh, those probabilities using a TI-84 plus calculator. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that technological companion coming up for this video lesson. Thanks again for watching.